Yeah. So again, as we talked about earlier, brain inflammation, right? The, the, the word there, the operative word is inflammation. And inflammation is not a dirty word. It's just something that happens because your body is responding to something. So what can cause inflammation in the brain? We talk about concussion, which is an injury to the brain, right? If you hit your head hard enough, the brain tissue inside the skull gets kind of squished around too much, can create shearing force, can create concussive force, Coup, de, uh, coup contra coup, whiplash injury, which can all cause your brain to get injured. And then that creates swelling. And then once your brain experiences a concussive or, or traumatic brain injury, is another word for it, is that you get, you go, your brain cells that are injured will go through what's called neural excitotoxicity because injured brain cells are not able to use energy as efficiently because they're injured, right? Their mm -hmm. capacity to pr produce energy and utilize energy becomes deficient and they go through neuroexcitotoxicity, which is a process where the neurons literally die off from like, you know, over excitability. Mm -hmm. See, yeah. the way neurons work is that as they go through degeneration, before they completely die off, they go through a period of overexcitability. Mm. So the overexcitability literally is the pre-death of a neuron. And injured neuron tend to experience more neuroexcitotoxicity. Now, the, the clinical application of this is that when you go through neuroexcitotoxicity, this pre-death of the neuron, neurons will start to fire more rapidly. That's why it's called neuroexcitotoxicity. Excito meaning they're firing more spontaneously, more rapidly. And this can result in unstable neuron function, meaning it's firing when it shouldn't be firing, right? So it's kind of like it's always on when you want to be able to turn on and off your brain cells, mm -hmm. but you can't turn it off. It's always on. And then that causes the, the neurons to basically burn themselves out. So in that process, people may experience unstable neuron functions. They may become light and sound sensitive. If those part of the neuron that process light and sound are going through degeneration and they're firing excessively, it may be very difficult for you to process light and sound information. People with cerebellum issues, they may go through periods where they can handle some vestibular and motion stimuli, but then if it's too much, then they'll start to you know wig out and they'll start to have symptoms you know, nauseous, balance problems, uh, maybe even action tremors that are associated with cerebellum issue from overusing that part of the brain. So people with, you know, brain injury tend to have weakness or low mental endurance, especially in that part of the brain that's injured. So those are the things that we look for uh, that could be a root cause, concussion or injury. Now, yeah. other things besides mm -hmm. that, you, you already mentioned, could be food sensitivity. Now, we talk about gluten because gluten is a known neurotoxin. It's known to create neurological problems. In fact, many of the symptoms of gluten reaction is actually extra intestinal manifestations, which means that the reaction, the symptom caused by gluten reaction is outside of the intestine most of the time. In fact, in the scientific literature, gluten reactions often associated with neurological manifestation. That's actually the most common manifestation yeah. of, of They call that non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So somebody exactly. who's not developing, their, you know, the gut's not being uh, massively inflamed and destroyed like, they, like an individual that's dealing with celiac, but other areas of the body are reacting to the gluten. And like you said, neurologically, uh, the neurons and different parts of the brain, different parts of the nervous system are the most commonly area that's affected outside of the gut. But keep in mind, it, besides gluten, there are other foods that can cause problem within yeah. the brain itself that can cross-react. For example, dairy has a potential mm. to cross-react with brain tissue. Egg has been found to have the potential to cross-react with cerebellum tissue. So the, the key word, the key takeaway here is that food sensitivity is something you need to be aware of. You need to track. Some people have very obvious symptoms where every time they eat certain food, they get brain symptoms. And other people, it's more subtle and it's not as clear. So a detailed workup and, and history is, is necessary to uncover these food reaction if they're indeed the cause of brain inflammation for some people. So we talked about trauma. We talked about food issues. Now, Infection is another category here. There are many infections that can either directly or indirectly cause brain inflammation. We know many of the viruses like herpes family viruses can actually literally crawl up through the vagus nerve and cross the blood brain barrier, get into the brain and cause brain inflammation. And we also know that there are many other infections like bacteria. This is what meningitis is, right? They can cause mm -hmm. infection of the meninges and therefore cause inflammation in the brain, encephalitis and so forth. 
so there, and, and mycotoxin from mold, mold exposure can also cause issues. So we know that infections can drive inflammation in the brain. And then the next category will be things like your um, environmental toxins, like heavy metal toxins, or any number of things that will get exposed on a daily basis can get deposited in the brain. And once in the brain can create oxidative stress, which causes tissue damage, and then you're going to have inflammation as a result of that. Right. So those are the major root fat, root cause factors. Now, what is the relationship between gut, the gut health, right? And the gut microbiome and perhaps intestinal permeability and gut inflammation. And uh, how does that correlate with neurological symptoms and brain inflammation? Uh, hugely. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, many people are familiar and may have heard of you know, the this brain-gut connection or the gut-brain connection depends on who you talk to. You know, people who are more focused on the gut, they will say the gut-brain connection, putting the gut first. And other people who are focused more on the brain will say brain-gut connection, putting the brain first. But really, it's a bi-directional uh, communication, both hardwired through neurological pathway and lymphatic system pathways, as well as chemically through different uh, neuropeptides and cytokines. So the brain and the gut are intimately involved in each other's function. And the reason is because the, the brain is mission critical, okay? And it's constantly trying to communicate to the gut what is happening within the brain. And so back and forth, the gut is also communicating with the brain what's happening in the gut. So in a gut, we have what's called the second brain. And these are the enteric nervous system, which is this network of neurons that innervate the gut. And some people say that the uh, enteric nervous system have more neurons than the entire spinal cord combined, right? So your spinal cord is all neurons that transmit information from your from the body up and down through through the rest of the body to the to the brain. But your enteric nervous system has more neurons than the spinal cord. So that just tells you how densely populated it is. And what happens is through a process called leaky gut, which is intestinal permeability you're gonna develop this mal, uh, double whammy of malabsorption and inflammation. When you have leaky gut, the intestinal tight junction starts to become disintegrated and becomes more permeable and microbial content, dietary protein or whatnot starts to leak in and out of the intestinal lumen into the systemic cir circulation that drives an inflammatory immune response. This inflammatory immune response is actually not happening just in the gut. Remember, once you have leaky gut, this mm -hmm. process is an immune response that starts at the gut, spills into your systemic circulation. But once it's in the blood, you have all these cytokines and chemicals that are signaling, hey, we got damage here. We got something we got to kill. That inflammation chemical is just in your blood, slushing around, and it gets to your blood-brain barrier, which are just simply blood vessels that supply blood to the brain. And if they, and when they cross the blood-brain barrier, it's going to signal to the microglial cells in your brain, which are specialized white blood cells in the brain, to say, hey, we are on alert. Make sure you guys, you know, get geared up for, for war here. So the microglial cells in the brain will start to become more sensitized. They can trigger more inflammation than normal. And then that can be an impetus for brain inflammation as well. So gut problem can definitely lead to brain symptoms and brain inflammation and vice versa. Brain inflammation can also lead to gut inflammation famous study, they induce brain injury in animal studies, like in rat studies. And when they lesion the rat's brain, within hours, they start to see the intestinal lining started to disintegrate, mm -hmm. meaning leaky gut. Mm -hmm. So this process can happen really rapidly. And clinically, we see this play out too. People with concussions, they tend to develop more gut issues, they get leaky gut, and that can later on develop into systemic inflammation and even lead to autoimmunity.